The first session up, we've heard a lot over the last two days about disruption, about new influencers. So what we figured we'd do is bring you some of these new influencers. So we're bringing you these new content makers. We're bringing these guys that are attracting millions of people viewing their YouTube work. So without further ado, to put this excellent and rather large panel we have, it's not even going to be a panel, you're going to like it. It's a different format yet again for you, so to keep you all engaged, keep you entertained. To lead us through this, uh, this great panel, we have Susan Agliata, who is the Head of Brand and Content, EMEA, for Google. Good afternoon, everyone. You all look uh, energized after lunch, a little bit. I think we've got some stragglers who are enjoying the sun, probably. But thank you for being here, because uh, it's by far going to be the most exciting panel of the entire conference, guaranteed. Uh, so we have a stellar lineup today, uh, some of our top YouTube influencers, uh, top YouTube partners from across Europe, and you'll be able to hear directly from them um, the change in the media landscape and the new celebrity um, and how that impacts our, our brands and, and the work that they do. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing uh, each one of them and then we'll play a, a short clip so you can get a feel for what their work is, is all about. Um, I'll start with uh, Conrad, Conrad Withy. He is the CEO um, of Pop Shack. Pop Shack is uh, one of the largest entertainment networks on YouTube focusing on music. Um, otherwise known as uh, Representatives Cahoots, um, which is one of our uh, YouTube bands uh, just formed this year. Um, a group of YouTubers got together and are now making some fantastic music, which Conrad will talk a little bit about. Um, so thank you, Conrad. Thanks very much. Sorry about the slightly shifty photo. That's a reminder. What you, careful what you put on LinkedIn. Um, so 18 months ago, I left uh, Warner Music Group, uh, running a major label to start Pop Shack. And I did that for three reasons. Firstly, young people aren't watching traditional media at all these days. We're listening to traditional media to get their music. They're finding it all online and largely on YouTube. Secondly, those same people don't pay for music anymore, which is a bit of a fundamental problem if that's your business model, trying to sell it. And finally, a new breed of artists are emerging, as we were just saying, on these platforms who, on their own, single-handedly, are building massive global fan bases. So it struck me there maybe needed to be a new business with a new model that was all about them. And that's really what Pop Shack is. I guess we're effectively a blend, uh, a, new, a next generation music label meets next generation MTV, something like that. Um, we don't sell the music, as I said. You get that for free with us. Uh, what we do sell is access to the connected fan bases of the artists that we, we have within our network. Um, the first 100 partnerships that, uh, that came to us, and we've been a network just over six months, um, brought with them 15 million subscribers on YouTube and around 17 million um, fans on other social, social platforms. So we're trying to reinvent what a music business looks like, and, and doing that right now with some great partnerships with global brands such as uh, Toyota, Vodafone, Coke, uh, Domino's. A lot of people who struggle in their day-to-day -day marketing reaching this demographic. Largely speaking, we're about uh, 13 to 24 year olds, and I guess it skews mainly to females, about um, two-thirds female, uh, most of the time getting their content on mobile. Um, hopefully, we'll get to work with a lot of you later in the year. We're aiming to scale the network significantly this year with a target of growing about five times from where we are right now. Um, you're also going to hear from Everall, one of our uh, best artists, a, a bit uh, later on. She'll show you some of the work she's, she's been doing. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to Richard, who is... I don't know your title, Richard. That's terrible. Head of FoodTube, and uh, he'll tell you more about what they're doing in the food category. Thank you. Quick intro to Richard. Oh, you can do it. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Um, let's give Richard a proper introduction. Uh, so Richard is... Uh, the um, uh, uh, network, uh, the head of the FoodTube network. I'm sure all of you are fans of Jamie Oliver. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have watched uh, FoodTube content. Um, Rich is the mastermind of this growing network of emerging talent. Uh, everyone from DJ Barbecue, who we also have, to uh, folks like Cupcake Gemma and uh, one of my favorites, Gennaro. Uh, Rich, please tell us about FoodTube. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so. About three years ago now, Jamie sort of, oh well, what we all did, sort of spotted a bit of a shift of Jamie's traditional audience away from Channel 4 and the, and the, the TV shows that we were putting on there. We were, there was a, a, a slight dip in, in the viewing figures overnight. 
Um, and we were wondering where that audience was going. Um, and it turns out that they were going online. They were going to watch the, his content when they wanted to with the VOD. Um, and they were going to YouTube. So when the Originals Partner Program with YouTube uh, was launched a couple of years ago, um, we got in the queue to see if we, we could get involved with that. And, um, and we did. And that's when FoodTube was born. It was, um, we sort of started the channel uh, in January of 2013. Um, and it was uh, a little test, a little experiment. We don't have much Jamie time, well, we didn't then. Um, we didn't have much Jamie time, so we needed to find a way to spread Jamie a little bit thinly across the, this, this new channel that we were doing. We wanted to do three pieces of, of um, content uploads uh, per week, because that's what you need to do, is get that schedule of people coming back time and time again. And we wanted to have an authentic... Uh, and real relationship and a dialogue with this new growing audience. So we launched a channel, uh, and YouTube said we'd be doing a pretty good thing if by the end of year one we had 100,000 subscribers. We reached 100,000 subscribers on the eve of our launch with a live show. Um, that was just through a few bits of content, um, the opportunity to slap Jamie Oliver on a, on a, on a video, which we launched out, which was uh, always a good thing for everybody to do. Um, so now we sit at just over one and a half million subscribers on the main channel. Um, we have lots of lovely talent like Gennaro, like DJ Barbecue, who you're going to see soon. Um, and we now have a small boutique network of channels as well. So these are all our friends, and there's three million subscribers in, in that network as well. So there's a, it's a growing army of foodies, and uh, we work with lots of lovely brands and, and hope to work with you guys more as well. So... Uh, that's me. I think my two minutes are up. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce uh, Fleur Brooklyn Smith. Um, Fleur comes to us from um, uh, Channel Flip, Flipside, which is the talent agency. Um, Flipside um, is one of the fastest growing multi-channel networks in Europe. They represent some great talent, such as Ashens, one of my favorite uh, tech bloggers. Um, also, Dan is not on fire, and of course, Nikki and Sammy, who we're lucky uh, to have here today. Uh, thank you, Fleur. Thank you. Um, Yep, so I'm one half of the team that runs Flipside Talent Management. We're based in London, and we represent a small but expanding number of uh, Britain's best and most exciting online entertainers and influencers, including Nikki and Sammy, who you'll meet shortly. Um, we act as a traditional talent agency in that we manage our clients' careers both on YouTube and on other digital platforms, as well as offline within a more traditional media and entertainment environment. Um, we feel that the YouTube community is edging towards the next big wave of digital influence now, um, with an erosion of the snobbery and suspicion that the old and new platforms seem to have against each other. Um, that seems to be fading away. And so at Flipside, we're actively encouraging our clients to embrace multi-platform activity. Using Nikki and Sammy as an example, uh, next month they're the online faces of Specsaver opticians in the UK, creating a a branded vlog video and social posts, which is a very digital thing to do. And then last night they broadcast their first ever show on BBC Radio 1, which is a very traditional thing to do and very cool. Um, in terms of working with brands, we always encourage our clients to take the deals that firstly best suit their personalities and secondly the ones that give them the space to be themselves. Um, if after this you want to have a look on YouTube at another of our clients' channels, Tomska, you'll see a really great uh, anti-ad that he did for Oreo cookies. Um, a lot of brands aren't brave enough yet to trust YouTubers with the freedom to do their own thing. Um, but I think this, this ad is, a, is an excellent case study because by allowing Tom to keep his anti-establishment and sarcastic tone, um, Oreos have ended up with a video that's got over 800,000 views, 35,000 likes, and crucially over 3,200 comments, so loads of engagement. Um, consistency of content is key with all YouTuber videos, but especially with their branded ones. And the creators know their content and their audience is better than you or I ever will. We know the landscape is constantly evolving, but while all the tech companies circle around and create the next social network and the next big platform, at the center of it all, we think, are the audiences. This is a people business, and content creators, like the ones you're about to meet, are the people you should definitely get to know. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, the actual talent. Um, so we have Evril, who is part of uh, Pop Shack. Um, Evril is um, uh, fairly new to YouTube, but she's made quite a splash, especially in the cover song space. So she's done some wonderful covers of everything from uh, Eminem to uh, Nicki Minaj. Um, so we'll have a short video to play showcasing uh, her talent. Hi, uh, my name's Avril. I am a musician and YouTuber, and I've been YouTubing for just under two years now, and in that time, I've crossed 85,000 subscribers on YouTube, 245,000 subscribers on Facebook, and I'm just approaching 9 million um, views on YouTube. And um, what I love most about YouTube is that it truly is a global platform. And um, it's allowed me to collaborate with artists all over the world, and I'm really excited to share one of those collaborations with you, which is a collaboration um, on the cover, Trouble, um, and it's by myself and Lindy Link, who's based in Atlanta. So, hope you enjoy it. Okay, it's Avril and Lindy Link. We're about to get into some trouble. What you think? <laughs> you must be a pot your mind. I'm making money, packing it up, and I do just fine. I count my money, cause I know I can't count on you. And I just sort of did it, did it like a queen would do. I talk in 7 11 battles, I'm getting into the models. Every word you heard is gospel, put your mind like in the pot. I'm putting a show, my dough, tipping it flow, leave out the door. <laughs> now, Lindy, on the lease. Don't you come here. Fresh and clean, smells like trouble to me. Mm. I always meet my men at bars or behind them. They always end up in these stars that they sign them. On a scale of one to title, how stupid are you? Your lies are getting all this vital. What you gonna do? Cause now you on my phone back, step out like a dome man. If you wanna get it close, this thing will be a codec. So take a picture, cause it might just last longer than the list of bitches that you plan on conquering. Don't you come? Next up, uh, we have uh, DJ Barbecue. Um, if you are a fan of meat and barbecuing, then he is your man. Um, he is a star of Jamie Oliver's Food Tube. Um, definitely check out his show for some summer barbecuing. Um, needs no more introduction than this. Uh, thank you, DJ Barbecue. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You got some pipes, girl. You can sing. Uh, my name is uh, Christian Stevenson, a.k.a. DJ Barbecue. I come from traditional media. Uh, I did my own TV series uh, in England for 10 years called Rad. It was skate, snow, BMX, surfing. I also had a show on MTV for three years, a global show, a big snowboarding series I did with Kylie Minogue. Times changed. People's viewing patterns changed. And I was growing older. Uh, and I loved barbecue, and I wanted to show off my love of barbecue. Luckily, uh, Rich and Jamie launched the Food Tube Network, and they were able to showcase my love of barbecue. Uh, now we're the uh, number one food network in Europe, third in the world. Um, I launched my own DJ barbecue channel about a year and a half ago. Just about hit 100,000 view, 100,000 subscribers. I've got over 20 million views across Food Tube and my channel and it's gone crazy. So I spend a lot of time shooting content, which I love, and then I spend the summers building pop-up restaurants at festivals, and we DJ and we barbecue. So we cook meat and we cook beets. And I have a barbecue with my decks built into it, so I'm, always, I'm spinning tunes out of a barbecue, then I've got big hunks of frontal muscles that I'm smoking, and we're just catertaining to the planet. So we do the live experience, and then we showcase what we do through FoodTube, and it's uh, pretty rad. Do I have a video? Do I have a video? Yes, I got a video. <laughs> Whoa!
And uh, last, but uh, certainly not least, because there's two of them combined, it's uh, Nikki and Sammy. Um, they have a very rapidly growing YouTube channel. Uh, Claim to Fame is documenting their journey to lose 16 stone, which is an epic feat. Um, so thank you for joining us, Nikki and Sammy. Hello. Uh, we're Nikki and Sammy, and we are YouTubers, vloggers, and content creators, and we make three comedy videos where am I going? Three comedy videos a week on YouTube. Um, they range from sketches to, well, tongue-in-cheek reviews of pretty much everything we can find online. I'm Sammy. Um, we started our channel a little over 18 months ago, and now we've got 100 and th over 130,000 subscribers on our channel. We have just over 8 million views across it as well. Uh, most recently, we interviewed the ex-Labour leader, Ed Miliband. Um, we probably cost him his election. Uh, but no, we do actually work with brands, and in the past we have worked with, and it's not limited to, uh, the BBC, Sky, Disney, and Channel 4. Also, alongside our online adventures, we do appear in real life like things like this. Uh, YouTube conventions, which are very similar to this, except there's a lot more young teenage girls crying and mums wondering what the hell they're doing there. Um, so we've got a video, which makes, I don't feel quite as cool as these guys, but here we go, here's a video. Hello, Hello. I'm Nikki. And I'm Sammy. I'm Ed. We went round asking you guys at the premiere what you thought made the ideal prince, and here are some of your answers. Disney <laughs> prince. Matt Smith. Matt Smith. Matt Smith. Hello. So the next generation can do better than the last. Powerful. That was less than. Really less than that was deep. That's that less than 240 hashtag words. Hashtag. Vote. I think I just had an existential crisis. What am I doing with my life? It's in my eye. It's in my eye. Scooters are, uh, who wants to be seen on a scooter, really? You well, know? My thoughts, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I mean, we don't even have to go into it, but if you're on a scooter, you've got other problems. If you come to the Alton Sausage Farm in Algeria... Who's my favourite YouTuber? You. If you can set again two camera... The, the two of them, Nikki and Sammy. Thank you. Oh, my favourite YouTubers. Are oh, my favourite okay. YouTubers. Translate me fade chiedo a mestesso a volt. I have my dog, my cheesy dog, my fat dog, and me stress about electricity. Volt. Pogo stick is is probably the one I would choose also because uh, if you have to see in, uh, into a, a window on the second floor, that's the way you're gonna go with a pogo stick. Exactly, it's very practical. Tip of the day. Uh, you can uh. Really good. And that means talking to the ladies in the right way. Hey beauty, can I introduce you to my beast? You might not know me, but I'm the eighth dwarf. Sexy. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, so last year, um, there was an article published in Variety Magazine, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, saying that um, top uh, five out of 10 celebrities are now YouTubers. Uh, YouTubers are more influential than traditional celebrities. So how did this happen? And, and Conrad and Fleur, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. What uh, uh, is the new generation finding in YouTube celebrities that they're not finding in traditional celebrities? Why this shift? Conrad, from the music world perspective, this has changed dramatically. I mean, we see so many new rising talent on, on YouTube every day. How have you seen this change in your experience? Yeah, I would say, exactly to that point, that it's a very authentic environment. It's very genuine, honest. I think what we probably found out is that all along, music fans have got talent. The direct relationship with the artists that they could, they weren't able to do that in the past, but these platforms weren't there. And also, the industry was organised around tastemakers who 
tried to decide for you what music you like. And what we suddenly found out is that the audience is telling everyone what they really like, and, and, and a breed of talent is emerging which is having this direct relationship with them. And it feels very, as I say, authentically genuine. I don't think there's any um, styling goes on when these artists emerge, and largely they're, they're starting literally at home in the bedrooms. So it's, it's, a, it's a very honest environment, and that seems to be the connection that builds. And they're very loyal, very engaged. Obviously, why they've got this tag of influences is because they can get that audience to do stuff for them. Which, when you are trying to go on and, and sell tickets or, or whether it's promote something, uh, has a fantastic strength. So I think it's that authenticity and that directness of the relationship. And Rich, in the world of food, from your perspective, how is this new talent developing? So Cupcake Gemma, for example, I know she's new to the platform. How do you develop this talent, and, and how do they really become personalities? Yeah, I, th I think there's there's a different... I mean, we, because we're a traditional uh, media company, we've, we've got a production uh, company for, called Fresh, which is where, what my caller Jamie shows for Channel 4 uh, and the, the rest of our, our content. But um, the transitioning Jamie from a, a sort of a linear star and a traditional TV um, face to online we thought was actually going to be much easier than than it was it was you know we thought we could you know tweet out to his four million uh, followers and say this is new thing happening over here come and check us out uh, and we found that actually they are they are very different audiences uh, online as they are on TV. It's much more uh, a passive relationship that you have when you're watching TV. You're sitting back in your sofa and you're and you're not you know not as engaged online. They're up at their computer or their or their laptop, and there's lots of flashing things on the right hand side that can tempt them away. So you've got to hook them straight away. So we treated them like a TV audience and. Uh, at uh, the beginning of uh, uh, our content, we would see a drop off in the first 15 seconds of 40%. This audience just went away because we were basically giving them a nice title sequence and a bit of waffle from Jamie at the beginning, and they were gone because they want it right there, right now. They want you to get to the point and straight to it. And that's why the, the likes of Cupcake Gemma, they, they are niche in as much as they are, she only does cupcakes. Um, but there is a huge audience. It's the, you know, using the Google SEOs and all that sort of stuff. How to make is a really good phrase on, on, online. And it's something that people look for all the time. And of course, any recipe is a, essentially a how to make video. Um, and we, we benefit from a lot of that. And it's that just trying to pick out where sort of maybe it's a frozen cupcake, you know, from uh, the film, You're just riding on the back of themes uh, and trying to understand what the audience wants you to give them because they're in charge and that's why you know working with brands is really important for them to understand that these guys are uh, will be if you listen to them and if you don't treat them in the right way they will go away from your content or not come to it in the first place at all so and Christian so Rich mentions authenticity staying true and then also working with brands so First question is, A, how do you engage with their audience? How do you create content that they want to watch? And in your collaborations with brands, how do you stay true to yourself and true to your content? Well, luckily, the, my audience tells me what they want. And that's, that's the beauty of YouTube is the immediacy, immediacy. You know, I'll do a recipe, and then I'll do a call to arms at the end of it. You know, what do you want me to cook next? You know, what animal? You know, what part? What vegetable? What should I grill? What should I smoke? And they tell me, and then we go back and we come up with a recipe. Um, and the, the interesting thing is getting the brands to come on and not just put their, their commercial. I mean, people don't even want, they don't want to see a 30 second ad. They barely want to see a five second ad. Um, and, you know, luckily you can click out of that five um, unless it's really engaging. But if the brands really want to come on board and be seen and be authentic, which is what you were talking about, it is giving us their product and allowing us to create content with their product. Um, we've, we've had major success with Hellman's mayonnaise, uh, Uncle Ben's rice, and getting these, and we've had some Pilgrim's cheese, we did the, the, the quesadillas, and that's where we win. You know, we keep it authentic, we're gonna use that product anyway, so it's in there, it, it's, it's like an infomercial that's not an infomercial. And, th and then we're, we're both winning, the client, the brand, myself, and then the audience. 
And Everell, I, I know you're new to the platform, mm -hmm. uh, quickly rising, but in terms of that authenticity, and, and I know you got started in covers, but yeah. A, how do you decide what, what to cover first? And yeah. uh, after uh, your uh, journey covers, what's next? What's next in your programming? Yeah, well, um, I decide to, um, to cover things based on requests, so what my fans sort of ask me, because they, they're always saying, oh, could you please cover this? Could you please cover that? And um, and also whatever's popular or whatever I like listening to. So, um, so you know, just anything that's on the charts, anything I hear on the radio that, you know, like I like to listen to, um, and anything that just sort of inspires me that I think, oh, that's that's something cool, I'd like to, you know, cover that. So, um, so yeah, as far as um, the way that I'm using YouTube, I essentially want to, obviously have an original artist. Um, that's my aim is to be an original artist, but I think the beauty of YouTube is it's really helped me to try out so many things and develop myself as an artist. So I've had you know, chances to try out different styles, different genres, different this, different that, and I really know now what I want to be as an artist, what my fans want from me, and what I can give them. So I think YouTube is great for just testing, testing things out as well, and seeing which fans stay with you, and which fans, you know, oh, you know, they, weren't, they were kind of just there for, just because they like the original artist song, but when they start to stay because they really like you, that's the type of fans you want to attract, so it's, mm -hmm. yeah. And Nikki and Sammy, the, the same for you. I, I know that you've been at this a while now. Um, you know, what's next for you guys in terms of your programming? So I think it's quite interesting because we're all YouTubers here in different areas, but we're all catering for our audience. It's our audience interest that we have at heart. So when a brand contacts us, it's, mm -hmm. um, as um, DJ Barbecue said over here, um, it's good that we have um, a free reign of what we're given. So when Disney asked us to help promote their Cinderella movie, we said, okay, let's go to the premiere, let's talk to the viewers that are there and say what they, see what they wanted. Um, and then we made that into a video which we discussed with them. So our audience is far more receptive when we have creative reign with what we're producing because we know better than any brand what they want. Uh, in terms of our channel going forward, it's always going to be a case of building up the channel because that's where everything flows from. Um, we are covering more and more filmic type things uh, whether that be a premiere or um, reviewing a film or reacting to a trailer, um, and we're hoping to do more in that field. But just in terms of our channel, it's, it's making more creative content, um, having, as everyone says, the authenticity and the free reign. They're going to be key words to the rest of this panel. Um, it's just being authentic and something, doing things we enjoy because ultimately our audience enjoys them as well. Um, so DJ Barbecue, you mentioned um, that uh, you're only going to work with brands and use their products anyway. Um, are there any challenges that you ever face in these interactions, any pushback? What, what's that negotiation process like when you're working with brands? It, it's a good question because a lot, I think you know, a lot of brands have their own agenda and you know, they're so used to the traditional way of making adverts, which is they they have an ad agency, they spend big budgets making these commercials, they put it in front of like some comedy or some, you know, or, or it, within a football match. And they control that content. And that's the challenge, is getting these big brands to work with us, trust us, work with us, not just give us the product, but you know, talk to us, you know, what do you want, what are your expectations? And it's just trying to tick all those boxes, but, all, but really, let them, get them to trust us because we talk to our audience more than anybody. We know what they want. We know what we can do with the product and we can be creative with it. And then it's not a commercial. It's just some rad engaging content with a product and everybody wins. And uh, Conrad and, and Fleur especially, how does media play into this in terms of promoting and distributing that content? There's a lot of collaborations going on. Um, what is the role in promotion in that? How important, how critical is promotion from a brand perspective? Um, in terms of promoting, sorry, in terms of promoting collaborations. Yeah, I mean, we're finding exactly what you just said there that the, the, the better the creative idea that we've done delivers. Um, I think what we're always trying to press on brands is that actually committing to this space for a longer period of time is, is far better than dipping in and out quickly in terms of seeing results. That said, when you engage a large group of, of artists, 
to, to try and do something in a short period of time, they can have quite an impact. And I think that's why we saw the guys at film premieres, because you know, they need to, to get a lot of people to know films over a short period of time. So we've definitely seen a mix of these collaborations with brands, whether that's their longer term, either 12 month strategy, or even a 24 hour one. So uh, I guess we're learning as we go as well how to package up these media opportunities for them and, and make sure you guys get the, you know, the metrics and the stats that you need to show a return on investment. I think we're learning that all the time. And are you seeing more budget shifting to that production and to that promotion from traditional TV budgets? Yeah, I, I would say so. And every conversation I've had is, is partly some, some brands are already there and, and pretty active, and, and others who are sort of like, we know we need to be there. We just don't know what our first step is. Do we, do, do we try something as a, as a test and then build from there, or, or, you know, or asking us what, what are the smart ways to just sort of put the tone of water, I suppose. We certainly see a, a move into the Um, for us, I think the most creative campaigns are the ones where people, uh, where brands know our talent and they come to us and they say, we just, we love Nick and Sammy or we love Tom or we love Dan and Phil. Here's our product, what can we do? Um, the things that we struggle with sometimes is when MCN's um, networks who've spoken to media agencies come to us and they go, we just need five people and we need next week and they need to do something with a box of cereal and you're sort of like, okay, what, and they've got half an hour to sort of make it and it's all very rushed. And I think the longer term relationship thing is really important because in the way that you might have a brand ambassador for a year in traditional television, you know, like Nicole Scherzinger and her yogurts, um, that kind of thing for YouTubers I think could work really, really well. Otherwise you end up, you end up with talent who are sort of feel like they're flogging everything. You know, you do 10 brand deals a year for 10 completely different products. You know, obviously, you, Christian wouldn't necessarily struggle with that because it's all food related. But I think with vloggers, we get, is it a phone? Is it sweets? Is it cereal? Is it this? Is it that? And it's kind of potentially, I think, could be confusing for audiences. So I would say, yeah, longer term, fewer brands and keep the consistency. That's what I would say. And Nikki and Sam, oh. <laughs> Nikki and Sam, in terms of your audience, do you see any pushback or any pushback in the community to Fleur's point about an oversaturation of these types of uh, collaborations? So we've seen other channels that have, um, not necessarily our own, because we're quite careful what we choose, um, but there's other channels that obviously do suffer when there's brand deal after brand deal after brand deal. Mm -hmm. And as Fleur said, it is confusing for the audience, especially when there's no clarity as what, if you're promoting or not. But for us, we're quite clear and we, we, we do prefer a longer term relationship with, with um, a brand because then it's, it's authentic to us and we have more free reign with creativity and it's, we build a relationship with that brand and that's important as well. Nothing to, Nothing to add to that. <laughs> uh, DJ Barbecue, I think this is a good point to talk a little bit about um, Ben's Beginners because I think that's a great example of a good collaboration that's long term and, and really is authentic. Yeah, we worked with um, Ben's Beginners. They came and uh, did some stuff with Jamie Oliver, made that dip, and it worked really well on a tr traditional aspect. Then they came on board and worked with us on FoodTube, and then I went with them, and they launched their own channel where I taught children how to cook. Um, I was trying to get, they, they did this study in England where families weren't cooking together anymore, so they decided to do this whole campaign. Um, it was good. We did some great recipes, we had a great crew, we, and the cool thing about Uncle Ben's was they didn't put rice in, we did 12 videos, 12 recipes, only a third of those recipes had rice in them. So they're not ramming their product down your throat, they're just you know, being authentic, they're being credible, um, and they're just showing you a, a plethora, a smorgasbord of really tasty recipes that kids and parents can cook together. So that was, that was where we all won. What they could have done was put it on our platform. So sometimes the brands get it almost right. We're finding that a lot. But we have the audience at FoodTube, you know, you know almost 1.6 million subscribers. Instead, the brands want to launch their own channel, which I understand they want to build their own place right there. But we've already got that audience, so it's a bit easier to get those, those eyes on their content. Um, instead of, they have to do a bit more of paying for those eyes to get on that content. So. It's a learning curve for everybody. We did it with um, Hellman's, where I used Hellman's in a couple recipes. Next thing you know, I'm doing ads for Hellman's, where they built me a barbecue that reacted um, to my turntables. So whatever music I was playing, the, the, 
the flames would, would burn differently, so I would cook my food differently. It was a great ad, very progressive for a big brand like Unilever and Hellman's. But then they just made it thinking it would go viral, so no one really watched it. So then this year, we built this ultimate machine to cook the perfect burger. So we, f we flew this burger in the air. We sent jets of spices as the burger flew in the air. I caught it, put it on a gyroscope, and this machine went across all these flames and cooked the burger. And they're actually pushing that one out there. So that's had uh, almost 700,000 uh, views. So it, it's a learning curve for everybody, but it, we're getting there, and that's, that's the good thing. Um, before we start to wrap up, are there any questions from the audience? There must be one. Do we have a microphone? Run forward from up. <laughs> I haven't done this for two days. Great panel, Gerhard Lowe from Deutsche Telekom. For global brands, scalability is very important. So uh, what my question is, is uh, really re regarding the international appeal of, of the stars. I mean, across, uh, I can understand in the English-speaking world, US, UK works. But you know, within Europe, we have uh, all these different languages and different uh, people. I know most of the countries have local YouTube stars, but how long will it be till we have pan-regional, let's say, uh, stars? Yeah. I think um, something that we did with Helmans, where we, we created a load of content for our Christmas campaign, uh, and the Helmans uh, had key territories that they wanted to promote this content in. So they uh, worked with Google, got some true view ads, and spent some money in targeted areas around the world, Brazil being one of them. Uh, and then they did our, a great job for us, which was translating all of our captions in Portuguese Brazil, Brazilian. Um, so that the audience is really engaged in that. And actually, we saw a huge spike in Brazilian subscribers because, firstly, they were putting our content in front of the Brazilian audience that were there, the food-related videos, uh, the true view, and also giving them captions that they could understand what we were saying as well. So it really, really worked really well. And, and you know, working with global brands is obviously much easier for everybody. We can all, you know, we can all do stuff. We, we've got a great deal with Bacardi the Cardi Global, which is for our Trixitude channel, so they sort of uh, look after the spirit section of that. And that's a great long-term, three-year relationship that we've got with them that can stretch across all their media partners around the world. And it's kind of exciting, but of course there's a few of those big global brands are few and far between, so it's how to work with localised talents, like I say, is, is a great way to sort of get that message out, or put your point your talent, point your great content at that local audience and treat them Yeah, and, and Fleur, I know that in, in my day-to-day, -day, I'm seeing this request all the time. From your perspective, are you getting more brands coming to you, requesting multi-market campaigns, influence that work across markets, across languages? Yeah, we do. Most of our, um, most of our followers are about 50% UK, 50% and 50, 50 UK and US, and then we have a smattering elsewhere, quite a lot in Asia and Japan. Mm -hmm. And the lack of subtitles doesn't seem to bother anybody. Things that do well and, and campaigns that you can do is if it's an international, for example, candy company, because a lot of the bloggers do British guys try Japanese candy, you, you can kind of, if you come up with a kind of way that's part of a usual video, you can kind of jump those audiences from one to the other. So it's just it's just thinking it through, but all of our audiences are, are international, all of our bloggers. And uh, Conrad? Just say, um, some of that music clearly it's always it's always travelled easily. The music tends to find the audience first. And while all our um, artists will do other things on their channels, it's definitely music entertainment. It doesn't really. So we don't see any problems with, with boundaries. In fact, it's far easier for us to work with a brand when it's a global campaign because actually, when someone says, "Actually, I really just want to do something in in the UK only," you start to scratch your head a bit because you can see that it's it's never the biggest market for us. It's one of the bigger markets, but actually, if we could just deal with a global campaign, it's much much easier. So if, if that happens. And uh, do we have time for one more question? If there's one pressing question. Thanks. Um, my question's about pricing. Um, how do you work out how much you charge for when you work with brands? How much of it is not quite making it up as you're going along, but how much is your comparing to maybe traditional media? 
uh, that brands might be used to working with. Um, we, um, we have a lot of brands that are So we are far over time, I believe, but um, everyone, please, at the break, have a chat with these folks if you want to find out more, work with them, find out about um, their networks and their programming. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, guys. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful, guys. Really good insight into uh, the new world of influencers, how it works, what it does. I have to say I'm pretty hungry for a barbecue later. I don't know about the rest of you.